Welcome to another episode of The Church Alive. It's the show dedicated to the new evangelization. I'm Sebastian Gomes with Sheridan Sanders. That's right, and we're so happy that you've joined us. Today we're talking about something that makes the church really special, the Catholic Eastern Churches. When we think of the Catholic Church, we tend to think about the Latin or Roman Church with dioceses all over the world and parishes in our local communities. But the Catholic Church is actually much bigger and more diverse than most of us in the English-speaking world know. There are ancient Catholic communities that trace their roots all the way back to the Apostles, and they have their own forms of worship, discipline, and spiritual traditions. These are the Catholic Eastern Churches. Here's the background. Jesus sent the apostles out to preach throughout the Roman Empire. And by the fourth century, a variety of Christian communities had formed in the East with different cultures. Now, this was also the time when the church was hammering out its main doctrines. And some of these communities fell out of communion with Rome. But over the centuries, many of the Eastern churches have reconciled with Rome. And today, there are almost two dozen Eastern churches that are part of the Catholic family. And it's so important for us to remember that the Catholic Church is bigger than our parish or diocese and that many Catholics around the world believe exactly the same thing that we do and yet practice their faith in their own way. If the new evangelization is about getting back to basics, these communities have so much to offer. They're some of the oldest Christian communities in the world with some of the richest traditions. That's right. But like you said, most Catholics don't know much about the Eastern Churches. So we wanted to go a little more in depth. Take a look. Christianity in Ukraine has been uh, a significant part of its history for well over a thousand years, but certainly the early roots come from the time of the early Christian church. What is the Melkite church? What is the Melkite rite? This is uh, an old uh, church that started almost from the dawn of Christianity. Our patriarch resides in different cities, but the major one is Damascus in Syria. Our church is a segment of the, of the Orthodox Church in Transylvania uh, that came into uh, union with Rome beginning in 1698, but actually the union is dated from 1700 in Transylvania, which is part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We received the faith, uh, you might say, from St. Cyril and Methodius. Two brothers from Thessalonica and Constantinople brought the the, the faith there, and of course, uh, Cyril is considered the father of the Cyrillic alphabet who translated the uh, scriptures into Slavonic from uh, uh, Greek, following the Byzantine tradition. It's, it's the same faith, uh, same scriptures, uh, same Holy Father that unites all of us. We uh, share that commonality. Certainly the things that unite us are our common sacraments. Our celebration of the sacraments tend to be um, different in tradition, but in essence the same. So we are Orthodox by, by spirit, we are Orthodox by tradition and heritage, and we are Catholic by unity with the Catholic Church, and uh, we are Catholic by desire, a historical desire that always was against any uh, separation inside the Universal Church of Christ. Even Episcopal governance is more than making rules. It's got to be about dialogue one way or another. The Holy Father is the Pope and the ministry of Peter is very unique in itself. But for the churches in communion with the See of Peter, all the Eastern churches, we are expected to be governed synodally. We each bring a gift to the other traditions and our unique gift is probably one of uh, liturgical music, one of icons, iconography, spirituality of uh, meditation. One of the things that I keep coming back to is the gift of hospitality. When you're a stranger, you're not a stranger for long. The uniqueness of the, the Byzantine tradition would be its emphasis on the Trinity and also uh, devotion to the Mother of God. In, in our liturgies, in our offices, uh, there's constant repetition to pray through the prayers of the Mother of God. We share the historical tradition of the East with the Orthodox. So we have married clergy. Uh, we have a different spirituality with the liturgy and the prayers. The contribution that we make to the Catholic Church gives the quality of 
witness of some of our martyrs, the fidelity of uh, our bishops who all died in prison, and witness to their profound belief in the ministry of Peter exercising the Pope, and fidelity and loyalty to that, but at the same time as uh, victims, um, prisoners of, of uh, their own conscience. And so they're also martyrs for the cause of religious liberty. We are looked upon at one time as we were going to be bridges to reunion with the Orthodox, but now it's, it's gone in a different direction. And so there, there are dialogues between the Orthodox and uh, Catholics, Roman Catholics, but it's uh, that each church maintain its own unique diversity. Synodality is a word that, that the Orthodox Church uses to describe its style of governance. And it was the word used by Pope Francis on St. Peter and Paul, ter, uh, June 29th, in terms of something that the Catholic Church had to really discover and begin to express. We've got this diversity amongst the various churches within the Catholic communion. I think that can be a wonderful model or expression for accepting the other, uh, going beyond, is this our comfort zone? Primacy and synodality are the two poles uh, in the discussion between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. And I think uh, it's a very lively time in terms of the interaction of those poles, the history of primacy, the history of synodality, how that worked itself out in different periods of time in the church, and how it needs to express itself now. And both elements are important to the life of the church. Okay, now that we have a little background on the Catholic Eastern churches, let's talk about Vatican II and the new evangelization. How does this all tie together? Well, you got it. We have to start with Vatican II. One of the 16 documents of the Council is the decree on the Catholic Eastern Churches, and it says some really important things. First, no individual church, Eastern or Western, is superior to the others because of its tradition. All are equally entrusted to the pastoral care of the Bishop of Rome. Second, each individual church has the right and duty to govern themselves according to their own disciplines. Third, the communion of the different churches under the Pope is actually a sign of Catholic unity. Now that last point is so key. The Catholic Church is not about uniformity. It's about diversity. Roman Catholics like you and me, Sheridan, are only one part of the whole body that makes up the Catholic Church. It's so true. And what a model for the rest of the world. There is such a thing as unity and diversity. Here's what the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church said about it. Our experience can be very important for the Western culture. It why this breathing with the two lungs means the interchange of our gifts. Western civilization has much to say to us in the East today, but I think that the mystical experience and the liturgical and ascetic life of the Eastern Christi Christianity uh, has much to say to the West. I love that image of the Catholic Church breathing with both lungs, the Eastern and Western churches. They're just not fully the body of Christ without each other. Yeah, and we have different experiences and traditions, but the same faith. And because of that, something like the new evangelization really applies to all of us, no matter who you are. Take a look at what the leader of the Syro Malankara Church in India told us in a recent interview. Wherever you are, whatever you are, whatever you think and act, your primary mission is to witness Jesus. And this one, this mission is intended to be for all, for all, for all the baptized. This is not an option. As St. Paul says, what to me if I don't preach the gospel? And this has been given to the bishops and it is up to the bishops and the Episcopal conferences and the Synod of Bishops of the Oriental Churches to bring out practical concrete expressions of uh, commitment. What the Cardinal said there is a good reminder that we're all called to do the same thing, really. We have to preach the gospel and we have to do it in the middle of rapidly changing societies. That's something all of the churches are experiencing today. Yeah, that's right. We're going to take a short break, but more on the Catholic Eastern Churches when we come back.
Welcome back to The Church Alive. Today we're talking about the Catholic Eastern Churches. Now the largest of these is the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, with more than five million members worldwide. Recently we had a chance to speak to the Metropolitan, or First Bishop, of the Arch Eparchy of Canada about the history and liturgy of the Ukrainian Catholics in this part of the world. Take a look. The first official Ukrainians who came to Canada came in 1891 and they came as farmers. They begin on their own to build their churches. They got some priests and nuns over, but they still needed a bishop to give that uh, final church organization uh, its stability. In 1912, the Holy See appointed the then Father Nikita Budka, who in Ukraine and in Europe had worked with immigrants. He would be one bishop for all of Canada. The majority of Ukrainians were settled in the prairies, but there were others as far as Vancouver to the west and as far east as Sydney, Nova Scotia. It did take its toll on his health. He went back to Ukraine where he died in 1949 in a concentration camp. Each church has its own particular uh, liturgical style, but uh, each one can make a contribution to the overall liturgical needs of people. The name given to this one is credited to St. John Chrysostom, although it's not thought that he actually wrote it as much as he edited the existing texts in his time. The Ukrainians have developed a lot of their own uh, musical scores for the liturgy. Uh, the style of vestments, uh, even the altar cloths, a variety of the, let's call it, secondary aspects of the liturgy have been quite uniquely adapted to uh, the Ukrainian church. We're able to bring about that depth of spirituality on the one hand, yet it seems to be a liturgy that is very easily celebrated by common people. This is a gift, I think, that we can bring to the Roman tradition and to the Universal Church. If you've seen this show before, you know that we like to highlight examples of the new evangelization on the ground. Well, in this episode, we wanted to take a step back and look at how the 2013 papal transition recharged the church at the top. People tend to think of the Catholic Church as something static and secure, steeped in so much history and tradition that it's grown a certain aversion to change. That sentiment went out the window on February 11, 2013, when Pope Benedict XVI, often labeled as a great conservative, made a radically progressive decision to voluntarily renounce the chair of St. Peter. Over the next 18 days, Catholics from around the world flocked to the Vatican to see the Bishop of Rome one last time and to say goodbye in unprecedented fashion. When the day of departure finally came, a distinct sadness and restlessness fell upon the city of Rome. Only the Pope showed signs of an inner peace. Having surrendered his authority and good conscience, his final act to teach the church and the world a powerful lesson in humility. So began the Sede Vacante. With no papal funeral and a series of scandals hanging over the Vatican, the cardinals, meeting outside of the media spotlight, spoke frankly about the state of the church and the profile of the next pope. Whoever it would be, he knew exactly what reforms his brother cardinals were looking for. Speculation had been going on for weeks, and every news agency had their list of candidates. The issues plaguing the church and the world gave rise to the notion that this was going to be a long and drawn-out conclave. Then, almost as suddenly and unexpectedly as it all started, The Canadian Jesuit theologian Bernard Lonergan once said, the church inevitably arrives on the scene, usually a little late and out of breath. 
But as the 2013 papal transition showed us, there are moments in history when the church's supernatural power bursts forth, propelling it forward in new and exciting directions. The people of our time will forever remember that moment in history, not only because of what has happened since, but for what is still to come. What an amazing experience that was for the Catholic Church. Yeah, incredible. We have a lot to be thankful for and hopeful for with Pope Francis, that's for sure. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more on the Catholic Eastern Churches, so don't go anywhere. spoke about how most Roman Catholics don't know much about our Catholic Eastern brothers and sisters. It's an interesting topic that we raised with our peers at Sultan Light. Check it out. What does unity and diversity mean and why is that important? Well, it, it's incredibly important. Uh, you know, I, as a child, I had the unique opportunity to grow up going to both uh, Roman and Eastern Rite Masses and liturgies. At the universal level, it's important for Catholics to know the whole church, that it's, that it's not just East and West, but also the day-to-day -day practices too. It, it can really, really give people an interesting perspective on the church. Yeah, I, for me, I mean, growing up in Latin America, I had no clue that there was a, a, a Catholic church that was not the Roman Rite. It never even came up. And we have a Catholic school system, for example, and they never have different rites, uh, liturgies. They never talk about, and, and there are students who go to those schools who are Ukrainian, who are Slovakian, who are Malkite or Maronites, and we are Coptics. So I think that, that unity, collegiality, all that stuff is, is great, but let's get to the point before that, which is just knowledge. For me, the wake-up call was covering the Synod on the Middle East. I actually had to have someone sit down and be like, okay, here's a piece of paper, draw me a diagram. Um, and I didn't know that, I grew up in Vancouver, I didn't know we had an eparchy until yeah. I was actually like a freelancer and I had to go cover the event. And I was like, whoa! I yeah, yeah. was shocked at how ignorant I'd been about these other, um, these like rights. And then I got really interested and I started going to different masses and just trying to see, you know, what the experience like. It added so much to my to my prayer life and, and, and just an understanding of, of the beauty of different types of liturgies and, and um, what they bring to us. And actually it made me appreciate the Latin rite more. Absolutely. Yeah. To, to know that we can all be part of one church with different traditions or different expressions of that tradition, which is the way I understand it. Right? Each of those are equal, like the way they're structured in the church, like the official teaching is all of those are equal and uh, independent in a certain sense. I mean, they're all under you know the oversight yes. of the Pope. Ultimately, he is the, right, he's the person who guarantees the unity. But within that unity, you you know you can do a number of different things, and, and you have these ancient rites that in many cases are as old as as, as the Latin rite, and or you know as, exactly. And you know, and when you talk about Pope Francis looking at for ways to to reform the curia, you know, looking at uh, changing how the church leadership structure might work, you know, the, there is a model in the East that you know is for, for themselves tried, tested, and true. I don't think it would be a huge stretch to say that he may be examining some of these models as a future means of you know how to how to structure the universe church as a whole. I call the Eastern Catholic Churches sort of the scab on the wound of division between Orthodoxy and Catholicism uh, because we won't go away even though it would be to everyone's advantage if we simply disappeared, then Roman Catholicism can talk to official orthodoxy without us causing trouble. But we're here, 
And because we're here, for whatever reasons, whatever part of God's plan that is, uh, what we have been able to do is uh, be, the, be a group that says to Orthodoxy and to Catholicism, you can't live without each other. We belong together. We know how important scripture is for the new evangelization, and that's why once again we sat down with Father Tom Rosica at Assumption University in Windsor, Ontario, to talk about the Word of God today. Speak about the Eastern churches, Christians of the East. Let's talk about Mary, the Mother of God, as a great bridge for the East and the West, as a model, a prototype of discipleship for both the East and the West. And since we're here in the chapel of Assumption University, let's talk about the Assumption of Mary as we celebrate it in the Latin Church in the West, and what the Eastern churches commemorate or celebrate in this mystery that being the Dormition of the Teotokos, the falling asleep of the God-bearer, the falling asleep of the Blessed Mother of Mary. After three days, the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Christians, celebrate that Mary was taken up to God. She was raised up to God and welcomed into the glory of the angels and the saints. In the Western Church, we celebrate the Assumption of Mary, which is a rich theological dogma which speaks to us about the end of Mary's life. It speaks about the fact that Mary was assumed into the Godhead. Mary follows the pattern that was established by her son in his bodily resurrection. And so rather than being a moment of, of difference, of, of trying to think that East and West have to think the same way, some kind of a uniformity that strangles us, the teaching of the Assumption the reflection of the Dormition of the Teotokos expressed to us the richness of the diversity as we come to understand God and his plans for us. Now, there's some foundational scripture texts which speak to the whole church. And one of them, a beautiful text, is the whole text of the Annunciation of Mary. It's a wonderful story, sort of like an Advent or Christmas story but it's not as simple as it seems. The angel Gabriel appears to her, and we have in the Greek New Testament that wonderful expression when the angel sees her, kaire kekaritomene. We translate a hail full of grace, kind of a static expression. But when you stop and think what that means, it's a loaded expression, literally, greetings. You who have allowed yourself to be transformed by God's grace. She could have said no. She allowed the spirit into her life to make such a huge difference. It's an awesome story. Pope Benedict, Pope John Paul II, and Pope Francis have all called Mary the star of the new evangelization. Why is that? It's a wonderful title. Pope John Paul II used it way back when he started launching this balloon, if you will, of the new evangelization, testing it out. But stop and think the significance of a star in the scriptures. We think of the stars in the firmament in the book of Genesis. We think of the stars in the night, that story in the book of Numbers. I see this star that's rising up. And of course, who cannot help but think of the star that led the Magi through that long perilous journey to the presence of Jesus in Bethlehem. By calling Mary the star of the new evangelization, against the darkness and the shadows of our time, against the struggles we have to proclaim Jesus and make him known, we have this light, this beacon that's always calling us forward. And Mary helps us to appreciate her son Jesus, especially against the encircling gloom and the darkness of our own times.
That's all for this episode of The Church Alive. We hope you learned a little bit about our Eastern brothers and sisters. The Catholic Church really is an incredible place to be. Yes, it is. Thank you so much for joining us today. For the crew here at CBC, for our friends at Assumption University, and for all of our colleagues at Salt and Light, I'm Sheridan Sanders. And I'm Sebastian Gomes. We'll see you again soon. God bless.